Hey, what's going on? Welcome to The Doug Show. I'm Doug Cunnington, and in this episode, I'm talking to Christy. Christy is a student of Five Figure Niche Site, and she has a site worth roughly $75,000 or more. She recently hit a big milestone of very close to $2,500 per month. That was uh, very, very recently, if you're listening to this, on the date that it's released. So she hit that $2,500 per month mark in December of 2019. The cool part is if you're listening to this episode, when it's published this week, I'm launching, relaunching my course, Five Figure Niche Site. So if you follow the link in the description, and it's during this week, so January 13th through the 17th, you can enroll. I don't open it up all the time. I do have like an evergreen funnel situation set up. So sometimes, you know, if you enroll in the, in my email list, you'll be able to enroll in the course when the time is right, when you're progressing through the funnel. And I launch the course four times per year. So each quarter, January is one of those launches. So anyway, I wanted to touch base with Christy. We worked together very closely um, through her niche site journey We were in the same town for a little while when I lived in Bozeman, Montana. Christy lived like uh, a mile or two away, super close. So we would have coffee occasionally, talk about nerdy stuff. And she even met Georgie one time when she came over to the house for an interview. She's joined me a few times. So I encourage you to check out some of her earlier episodes as well. I'll put links in the description and show notes and all that business. And she came on when she hit certain milestones. So it was like $100 per month was kind of a big deal. And then I think she hit that within like three to four months, pretty quick, pretty quick. And then uh, when she hit $1,000 per month, she came on again. And now 2,500, she's doing quite well. We go pretty deep into certain areas and we talk about a few of the blog post that Christy wrote for me and I published on Niche Site Project. So I'll put links to all that stuff as well. They're very good reads. She is an excellent writer, which is why I asked her to write for me because she could do a better job than me. And she's a she's a good editor as well. Uh, I, I've actually written a couple guest posts and I had her edit for me just because Like I said, she's a better writer and editor than I am, so I lean on experts when I can. Anyway, I've rambled on quite a bit. If you have questions for Christy, you can send me an email. If you're watching the YouTube video, you can leave a comment. I will definitely have her on again in the future. I'm working with her to grow her site even bigger and and better. I think we hit a couple points where she has like neglected certain pieces. So part of that is around link building. I think a lot of us are guilty of just putting time into content, focusing on content and just ignoring the link building part. And we kind of, we dig into that a little bit here. And that's one of the big things that we're working on. So I will send it over to the interview and I'll check in with you on the other side. Hey, what's going on? It's Doug Cunnington here for The Doug Show, and I'm here with Christy. How are you doing today? Hey, Doug. I'm good. And you are a student of Five Figure Niche Site. This is something like your third appearance, Um, so thanks a lot for taking the time. And for the people that have not heard the other episodes with you, can you just give a little intro about yourself and um, like your full-time job, how you got into niche sites and that sort of thing? Sure. I got into niche sites about a year and a half ago, I would say. My full-time job is in marketing, so I actually run my own business, and I started getting into the niche site thing just because I actually heard you on a podcast and was interested in it and just kept educating myself ever since, so that's my background. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And the reason why you're on here is you hit a a great milestone recently. So can you share like the earnings, um, the most recent earnings from the last month? And we're publishing this very close to the time we're recording it, which I don't always do. But yeah, so what are your results right now? Sure. 
The site started back in October of 2018. So it's gone through all of 2019. Uh, through 2019, it earned over $13,000. And then in just the last month of December, which of course over the holidays could be a little wonky, but that was just like spitting distance to 2,500. Cool. So that was exciting. Very good. Congratulations. I know that's a big milestone and you're, um, you're pretty like, I would say goal oriented. Would you say type A as well? I think we would both say that. <laughs> okay. So self, self-admitted, yes. not that it's a bad thing. Self-awareness, super yeah. high. <laughs> so you set some like pretty specific goals of like what you wanted to hit and, and what that would allow you to do. So can you just talk about like some of those goals and milestones and then like right now, what is this like 2,500 bucks a month doing for you? Sure. So right at the beginning, and I think it was based on one of your emails that you sent out um, right at the start was, you know, coming up with your why basically and why you want to have a niche site. Um, and hopefully, you know, it's a reason that's a little deeper than I want to make a million dollars overnight. It's probably isn't the way to do that. But uh, you would encourage us to basically come up with our why and what our goals would be. So I came up with about 10 financial milestones that I wanted to hit, just mostly based on like what I currently make for my job, because that's the only reference point I have. And then for each of those categories, I would say basically, what could that pay for? So, you know, this month it might cover my pet expenses. Um, at this level, it would cover my mortgage. At this level, it would cover, you know, mortgage plus a vacation or something like that. So uh, as I go along, I do kind of keep track of where I am on that milestone uh, list. And yeah, I'm trucking along. I'm on like number three. <laughs> Very good. That's good. Congratulations. I know, I mean, it's a lot of money. For most people, that's going to pay for a mortgage and a little bit more, depending on like how big of a house or uh, yep. whatever their domicile is. So that's awesome. I think... Um, it's interesting to note that you've been able to hit an ROI positive point pretty quickly because you've done a lot of work yourself. And I think that's impressive. Like, can you share a little bit about like the expenses and that sort of thing? You don't have to go too deep in detail, but um, just sort of high level. Yep. Uh, when I look back on all of 2019, um, like I said, the site made a little over $13,000 for the year. And then of that, I had about 80, almost $9,000 that I put into it. Now, not all of that though was actually going into the site. So there was a good chunk of that that was educational expenses that were you one- You paid time. me. Right, like <laughs> buying a course, you know, cause yeah. I had no idea what I was doing. And, you know, those are investments that, like I said, that's not going to be a year over year site investment to keep it going. But I was willing to invest in the educational piece right up front. And then um, another probably 5,000 of that was for content. Um, my approach was that if, you know, I wanted to fail faster, essentially. Um, and, you know, because I had some disposable in some income that I could put into it, I wanted to really grow the content over the first year and see if the model held right and if it was worth putting more time and energy into so for me that was worth it you definitely don't have to invest that much right away um but you know again when you think about it if i put in let's just say nine thousand dollars for the first year well last month i made 2500 so you know like if i can put in a fair amount up front and then get a higher functioning site with better monthly income, like that makes it back quite a bit, uh, quite a bit quicker. So yes. that for me is still, that's still worth it. Gotcha. Yep. And some people may be thinking, oh, I can't believe like $5,000. That's a crazy amount of money, but yeah. it wasn't all at once. Number one. And then you saw that 
what you were doing was working. So maybe you started small and then you increased the expenses as you felt comfortable with it, right? Correct. I spent probably $500 on my first set of 10 articles um, that were the first ones I ever outsourced. So cool. started small and made sure that I even liked doing that as an option. So. Right. Right, right. Okay. And just at a broad level, uh, one of the questions that I want to ask is like, what's the reason for the site's success? And it's, uh, you could take it in whatever direction because there's a lot of moving pieces and the way you approached it. Yeah. Well, the first thing I would say is I'm in there almost every day. So part of that is because I chose a niche that I am personally interested in. I think it would be different if I was writing about something I didn't care about, vacuum cleaners or something, which I did buy a vacuum cleaner after visiting a niche site. I do want to say that, <laughs> but so they are useful, but for me personally, it's not my passion. So for me, you know, it's a lifestyle blog and I'm on it every day because I enjoy doing it. Um, so I think that's a big piece of it is that it wasn't something that I just started, worked on for two months, got bored of and expected it to keep making a lot of money. So for me, just being able to continually be in there Um, And like doing it, like working on it is a huge thing. Um, The other thing I would say for me personally is that having a marketing background, the site looks professional, the content is professional. Um, I've been a writer for years, so I spend a ton of time on editing, which I know a lot of people don't like spending time on. Um, And it is a huge time suck. I won't lie about that. But I also feel a lot better about the content that I put out. So... For me, it's worth it. Um, It also keeps me really tuned into what content I have when I've been outsourcing things. So it's really easy to get so much content that you forget what's even out there, what you've covered, what you haven't, what you can link to. Um, So spending more time in there editing actually helps me out, at least in the short term. So having a professional looking site, nice content that's edited, um, and then just, you know, being in there every day, kind of working on it. Uh, I think those are all distinguishing factors for me. Cool. And I have seen, um, I've interviewed a lot of people, a lot of students, and I know that people get obsessed. So you're describing mm-hmm. that you're obsessed with it. I get that. I'm a little obsessed with it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm like that in, in various areas. Uh, Ron Stefanski, mm-hmm. he gets into it. John Dykstra, he's into the process and, and yep. all that stuff. Um, Marty McLeod, Evan Porter, like yep. either they're doing the writing, they're obsessed with it, they're into it. Um, it's common, definitely a common thread where people enjoy either the topic or the process. Right. I'm kind of process oriented. Um, so I don't always get obsessed with like vacuum cleaners or okay. whatever. Uh, and I don't know who would be, <laughs> but the people like there the process <laughs> of reviewing it. So right. um, one other thing I want to point out. So we're like taking a snapshot right now. We're like $2,500 a month. That's great. And I want to emphasize that people should listen to the other episodes because you hit other milestones, I think a hundred and then a thousand dollars per month. But when you uh, shared the graph, uh, which people could check out um, on on the video, and I'll share the screen and all that stuff. But basically, this is like slow, gradual growth. Um, there was never a like huge, massive jump. There were a couple like three, like one month month was like three x, and then there, there was another jump. But yeah. in general, it wasn't like all of a sudden you're making um, like huge amounts of money. It's just like slow plotting progress. So how do you keep motivated when it's so slow and you didn't know if it was going to work? Uh, well, I think the first thing was to just set my expectations correctly. Uh, you were a piece of that. Definitely. I think you were really upfront in the course and just in your other materials of saying this isn't an overnight thing. Right. And I think once you, start learning more about how Google works, how SEO works, then it really clicks of, yeah, this is going to take some time. Mm -hmm. Um, But the nice thing about, you know, doing the KGR, at least in the beginning, is that you do see some progress and you can see some results right away, which is the key to staying motivated. 
right? So if I hadn't seen a single dollar in six months, I probably wouldn't continue. And that's really realistic if you don't go after like some KGR keywords, right? So if I had only gone after giant keyword traffic uh, phrases, I probably would have burned out also, no matter how passionate I was about the topic. Um, so I think it's really important right up front to tell yourself that if you need a quick fix, if you need like a way to pay your mortgage next month, this is not that. But for me, I wanted something supplemental to kind of diversify my life income, right, for my other business. And I wanted something that I would enjoy working on in my own time and eventually could be more of a lifestyle for me uh, than running a services-based business, which I do now. Perfect. And another thing I want to point out and emphasize, so we talked about some of the expenses and you like broke even before you're making mm -hmm. profit. Now you could reinvest like comfortably and you're continuing to make a profit each month. The value of your site is probably in the like 70 to $90,000 that's a nice number. <laughs> yeah. So like if someone, if someone is thinking, Hey, that's a lot of money that you spent. Um, right. it's actually worth quite a bit. If you look at evaluation, if you yeah. shopped it around, I know because it, you're obsessed with it. Um, and you spend so I'm much time, <laughs> you're not going to sell it, but yeah. it's kind it's, it's comforting but to know building an asset and should an emergency arise, you built something of value, which I do think is important. Yeah. So, yep, you put in a, a lot of money, uh, even more time, but you have like an asset that's very clear that there's value there. So very good. Mistakes. So we all end up making some mistakes, even with expert guidance and um, yep. when you try to do a good job. So can you talk about a few mistakes that you made? Yeah, I think there were quite a few things that I did partly well which I classify as partly mistakes. <laughs> so one of the things that I did well was create like an Excel spreadsheet right off the top, every article, like my checklist of what needs to be done, every article. So I have a really clear sense of like every post that's out there, when it was posted, like how long I expect it to take to rank, all that good stuff. That's nice. I did not do that for things like images, right? Which I now kind of wish I'd gone back and done that I'd kept track of which free stock sites I got things from just to cover my bases. Uh, you know, once you're 200 posts in, that seems pretty giant to go back. How'd I to do it again? I would probably add that to my nice little spreadsheet uh, just as like a comfort factor. So that would be one. I would also be a little bit more strategic about the social media stuff. Um, what I did well was focusing on Pinterest primarily. Um, I wrote another article about Pinterest and how it drove, I think it was like 13 to 15% of my early traffic. And I think it's still right around there. I think it was like 15 or 18% last time I checked for the year, which is really good when you're still trying to get organic traffic and you're, you want it from anywhere. So for me, Pinterest was a great place to go because it is a search engine. So you can apply a lot of what you're already doing on the site to Pinterest. So that was good. I wish that I had not started an Instagram. <laughs> kind of a time suck and I don't work on it and I don't like doing it. So that's probably not a huge advantage to be spending any time on or just the time spent feeling guilty about not spending time on it. I don't need to be doing that. Yeah. Um, so I would have been a little bit more strategic about that. I think the other thing I would have spent more time on is the link building, which you and I have been talking, talking about lately and just doing a little bit more of that along the way. So for me, I needed to focus on content, right? And that was where I put all my time, and my energy, and I got to like 200 articles and I felt really good about that. And then now we're to the point where I need to catch up on the link building. So that's kind of the next thing for me. If I were to do it over, I would have been doing that kind of the whole way. Which is in the course. So I'll just, uh, <laughs> it is. yes. But I mean, I think part of it's my fault. I, I talk about this sometimes on YouTube where I'm like, hey, if I put out case studies, like sometimes people like 
focus and just really focus on that one piece. And I know because I've gotten probably over a hundred emails where someone's like, I'm going to publish 200 articles in five months, which is exactly what I did. Um, But I can't blame you, right? You had um, a content background, you're a writer, you like the topic, um, you like working with freelancers and hiring people, like it fits perfectly. And obviously, I mean, it's working for you, but I think, yeah, we can take it to the next level um, by, you know, I guess patching up the area where you've kind of neglected and there's a lot of approaches to it. Now, you have done some very interesting link building and outreach. Um, do you want to hit like a couple of the ideas um, yeah. that you've talked about before? <clears throat> One of the early things I did that I didn't know if it would really pay off at all um, was that there was a vlogger in my niche that I noticed was fundraising. She had a project and she needed to basically cover some expenses to be able to do it. So that was the point where I thought, you know what, I'm just going to reach out to her. I have barely a site at all, but I'm going to just see if she would write for me if I donated towards this cause that she wants to support. And she said yes immediately. Like I felt like I had just been contacted by like, I don't know, like some kind of rock stars. Like I was like, so butterfly about it that this vlogger that I've been watching, like she yeah. said, yes, you're just gonna write my site. Just really very cute. And so I actually, I brought her on for 10 articles, like right up front because it was good for her. It was good for me. And it gave me a real boost because people that followed her would go to her articles and it really showed Google, you know, in those first like two months, that there were people actively searching for the name of my site, for her content. So that was huge. Um, And I can now use her as basically an example of someone that I've worked with. So hands down, love that, would do that again. So that was the very first thing that I did. I also created, um, along the same lines, basically a media guide for bloggers in my niche. So I spend way too much time on YouTube. Not all of it watching affiliate content, although obviously I do that too. So I pulled out probably 10 or 12 of the people that I watched the most. And I created a media guide as a resource saying, here are the people you should be watching. Um, Every person got their own dedicated page, my top five videos for them, like all the key players. So it was a decent amount of work to do that. But it also brought in, I think, like 6,000 page views in the first year, which for a new site is good. And I will take that. And again, it's just people that now that I'm going to focus on outreach, those are the people that I can easily go back to. And it's a bit of a warm, a warm intro, right? To say, hey, I've been following you. Here's the proof of that, right? That I talk about what you're doing and I love what you're doing. So let's partner on X, Y, Z. So those are two ways that, um, you know, were not things that I necessarily heard about people doing, but in my specific niche, blogging is big. And so I wanted to take advantage of that. If you highlighted like a, a perfect example where you, you, you landed that first vlogger and now you could say, Hey, I worked with this person. They can see, um, that very clearly they could go check it out and then they realize, okay, like you're doing interesting things. And by the way, um, I was impressed when you did this, but, uh, like in the very beginning, but it's like, you didn't have much content on your site. Nope. Um, there was no track record. It was like a nope. couple months old max. Right. Mm-hmm. And I it think pe- 10 articles on it. Yes. When I launched, I know it's a different space, but I launched niche site project and I did the same thing. I had maybe four articles in internet marketing is pretty competitive because there's a bunch of marketers doing it, but I was able to network in a similar way, like talking with people that maybe shouldn't like care who I am or anything like that. And they were like, okay, like we'll see how it goes. And if you get one or two of those, then other people with a social proof are more likely to work with you. So you put yourself out there, it worked out. Now a year later, you're able to like land other bigger 
bigger uh, fish or whatever. So, right. Okay. And it was something where I could feel good about it too, because I wasn't just asking for something, right. I was reaching out because this person had a need and something that they wanted to be doing. And I could also help with that. So that it felt like a really good initial transaction. So. Hmm? Similarly. Um, and I just remembered I landed an interview with a much actually a few at this point, a much bigger vlogger um, because I knew that they were releasing a book. They were launching a book and I was like, Oh, they'll talk to anyone who asks and not that many. It was the wrong space. Yep. Like people didn't care, but I made a contact and ended up I actually met my, one of the VAs that I worked with for a long time. This is going way tangent here. So I met a VA who ended up working yep. with me for years who actually um, helped my wife get a job and that's why we moved. So like through that, I forgot that that's how it was all tied together. Um, but it was like a friend of a friend and then her mom and then blah, blah, blah. So then we moved. I mean, I think you have to make it personal, right? Cause you're, everyone's running an internet business. Anyone that you're going to talk to here pretty much. Yeah. And it gets really, I think it gets lonely for people, right? That are even putting out a lot of content, like vloggers, podcasters, like, is anyone listening? Is anyone watching? Like, are they just in it for the free content for me? And so to have someone reach out and be like, I see this is what you're doing in your life, right? I would like to help support you in that. That's a nice email to receive, right? And it's a nice one to be able to send. So the more that you kind of watch people in your space that you do want to connect with and genuinely reach out when they have things going on, I, you know, that's nice for everybody. Awesome. For the content, I know you emphasized editing, make sure that it's high quality. Do you have any other tips, uh, especially for people who aren't writers or they don't see it as some, one of their strengths? Yeah. I think you can definitely have a successful niche site and outsource a lot of the content, right? So if you do have some disposable income to do that, um, I worked with Upwork writers for the very first time, just based on your recommendation to do it. That made me very nervous. I am, like you said, a control freak about that stuff. And I wasn't really sure that I wanted anyone else writing content. And I still see a ton of people in Facebook groups that are like, I won't let anyone write on my site. No guest posts, no nothing. I write everything to keep the integrity, which I guess is fine. But there are tons of people who know stuff that I don't, right? I'm not, I'm not the be end all of my niche, right? So to me, it's like, yeah, I don't want a site where I haven't written anything. But nor do I want to say where I'm the only one contributing. Like that leaves a ton of topics that people want to know about that I just can't write about. That's not my background. I don't have any experience in it. Um, you know, so, so for me, it's like I can go out and find people on Upwork who are lovely to work with. It turns out I wasn't sure that would be the case either. They're lovely. And I can find people who have different skills and different backgrounds than I do. And yes, their writing may not be exactly how I would do it. So fine, I spend time editing it and I make yep. it more like what I like. Um, and that's okay. But for me, it was like, if I want to cover more topics, I need to go find people who are experts on those topics that I can't write about. So I've written a couple other articles for you about how I did that upward process, like start to finish and it was super successful. Like I had a really good experience and I know some people don't, um, but I think it's all about how you approach it and especially about how you interact with your writers. Like, I think that's a really big deal. And as a writer, I know that I appreciate that. So, you know, for me, it's about treating them like people, appreciating their expertise, keeping track of who does a good job and who doesn't, you know, and then, offering them topics that they are going to find interesting instead of me just assigning things. Right. So I want to know their background and I want to give them things that they are excited to write about. So that's worked out great. Yes. People should definitely check out the 
uh, basically it's like a, a full guide on how to hire people, the exact templates. And in fact, I know uh, one of my friends who was doing really well with her site already um, followed the guide. She had something like 90 articles written in a pretty short time. I can't remember. It was more than I thought she should try, but she did it and it worked out well. Um, and I think she even like, yeah, yeah. She like personally reached out to you. Yeah. So that worked out really well. So we're going to start wrapping up here and do you have any, you, you gave us so many tips already, but from like maybe a higher level or mindset approach, do you have tips for people who are either looking to get started or they're just getting started? Maybe they're just making a few bucks a month. I think the mindset is key. So knowing at the outset that it's not going to be an overnight thing, that's a biggie, right? You have to set your expectations correctly. There are the anomalies, right? And they're all over the internet of someone that made, you know, a ridiculous amount of money in three months or something. That's great. That's probably not going to be you and that's okay. That's all right. Um, But I think the big thing for me is finding one or two like educators that you're going to follow instead of trying to follow everyone. Right. So I chose you and maybe one or two other people that I, you know, watch their blogs and things. Everybody has a different approach. And if you try to follow everyone, your site is going to be just like soup, right? It's just not, it's not going to work out. So find a couple people that you really think are doing a good job, follow their advice. Um, the other thing this is a little thing, but I wish I'd done it sooner. I created basically a what I did when list. So I only created that maybe four months ago because I was having such a struggle remembering when I did big things. So when I was then looking at the data a couple of months later, I could see a spike and I, I couldn't relate it to anything. I was like, great, something happened in the middle of August. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I contributed to that or not. So now I just have like literally a text file where I do something that's major. Like if I take ads off a group of posts, I put that in the file, right? With the date that I did it. So then if I see a blip, if I see something different in the data, I can go back to my list of what I did when and align it at least a little bit to see if I contributed to whatever just happened. So I would have done that from the beginning. It doesn't have to be every task that you do, like just the big stuff that you think might make a difference later. So I would do that. Um, and then I probably would have, and you may disagree with me on this, I probably would have put in ads a little sooner, but I like having the, you know, diversified income. For me, that's just a safer place to be. So I put ads in probably six months ago. I use Mediavine. I love them. Um, and that was really cool to be able to have a second source. So now I'm going through and deciding which posts to take ads off of. Buyers intent posts, for example, like you suggested, go back and take maybe the top 10 buyers posts by traffic, take ads off of those and see if you make more from Amazon or other affiliates than you did from ads. So that's kind of the, you know, the trial period I'm going through now. But having ads on my site, I don't regret that. You can control a lot about how many there are. um, And that's great. But now I'm to the point where I can go back and say, okay, where could I be getting more from Amazon and other affiliates? Where could I make up more than I'm losing in ads? So that's where I am now. But those are a couple of things I would have done. And I'm glad you pointed that out. I forgot to highlight that. So you, I think you're making like two thirds from Amazon and then about a third from uh, other yeah. sources, mostly display ads. Last, last month I think was like 1500 from Amazon. And then about 900 from ads. So yeah, I really, I did not lose as much by taking ads off of those first 10 trial posts. I made more than that. Um, Granted, it was holiday season, so we'll see. But holidays, not a big thing for me. Yeah. And it's a whole other debate. Maybe we could talk about just, you know, like you said, I I was like, hey, don't put ads on. Yep. And then... 
other people are like put ads on, you can make more, which you almost always will. Sure. Um, but there's always a trade off, maybe not always. I mean, for sure. maybe the trade off isn't as big of a deal, but anyway, it's debatable. And I, I could see that. Cause like when you, when you started showing me how much you were making, I was like, well, that's significant. Right. right? So excellent. Yep, I agree, but it's a balance for sure. And you kind of just have to trial and error, which ones are good for ads and which ones aren't. And you may be leaving some money on the table either place. And that's just the name of the game. So. Yep. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot for joining us. And if people have questions for you, they can leave a uh, comment on the video or like uh, a comment on the podcast or whatever. You can also like leave a voicemail if you want to. And then maybe we'll, we'll do another round where we answer questions potentially. So thanks a lot. Definitely appreciate you uh, taking the time today. You bet. Thanks for the guidance. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot to Christy for joining me today. And like I said, if you have questions, you can leave comments. You could shoot an email, feedback at doug.show, and we can log them, have Christy on for another episode. I think um, you should definitely check out some of the blog posts that she's done on interesting outreach ideas. She did some sort of off the wall, out of the box things that I have not heard of. Some of them worked well. Some of them didn't work as well. And by the way, just because they don't work or they didn't work for Christy doesn't mean they can't work in general. It just didn't work in her niche, in her situation. So yeah, Christy's great. And check out uh, some of her content out there. Oh yeah, and because she has worked so much with freelancers and she's a, a writer and she understands the, the content side of the equation, she has a super awesome blog post on just hiring a lot of writers. So before I go on, I want to mention that Ezoic is a partial sponsor for this show. And it's brought to you in part by Ezoic Sponsorship. So thanks a lot to Ezoic. If you're unfamiliar, I highly encourage you to check out Ezoic. It's a software platform that helps website owners make more money from their sites. Ezoic uses machine learning, basically artificial intelligence. That's AI. That is sort of like the Terminator, but not exactly because... Um, it's not trying to take over the world and I'm mixing analogies, maybe confusing the matter, but the goal from Ezoic is to provide a better visitor experience, which in turn helps you earn more money. Basically, Ezoic's AI optimizes the revenue on a per visitor basis. It's not just a display network. It's a way for you to place ads where you want them to go. Ezoic's AI optimizes for you know each visitor it helps you sculpt the site exactly how you want it to go as far as uh, where the ads are going to go ezo tests the ads the networks the locations the types of ads all that business i've been playing around with the site speed accelerator which i'll share more information about as far as the results that i've seen personally but it makes optimizing your site easier. So it optimizes images, it helps you do lazy loading, it takes care of CSS, minification, all the complicated stuff that is confusing to set up with plugins. So I highly encourage you to check out the free seven day trial from Ezoic to test out the site speed accelerator. Thanks again to Ezoic. At the top of the show, I mentioned that if you're listening to this episode, during the launch period in January, you can enroll in the Five Figure Niche Site course. And I'll tell you right now, it's a premium course. And that is a code word for expensive. Basically, it's a premium course. And I'm confident in charging that much because number one, it takes me time to work with students. I don't have a big team. I don't have a, a huge staff or any sort of like crazy tracking or anything like that. And I provide the actual service, right? So I provide the actual support. That's the, the more correct way to say it. So if you have a question, I answer the question. I do have one person that helps me field some of the common questions, some of the frequently asked questions out there. And she's been working with me for a few years, a good friend of mine. So she helps out with some of the frequently asked questions. But basically, 
a lot of other courses don't offer you like actual support from the creators and people want to protect their time and that sort of thing. I've opted um, to do it a slightly different way. So I know some, some of the courses do have like a Facebook group or something like that. And it largely relies on student support where other students answer each other's questions and that can work. Okay. And then the course creators completely stay out of it. So mine is an an email uh, account that I have access to and one of my assistants has access to to answer questions. So basically, if you need help, I answer the question. So that is part of the reason why I throttle down like the number of students that can enroll. I limit it. There's a a course package, the premium package, where you get four one-on-one sessions with me. I like to use those within like a year or so, but I'm not a super stickler because I limit it so much. There are so few people that um, that I allow to enroll at that level because it takes a lot of time. That's four hours per premium student. So you could do the math, right? If I had a hundred people enroll <laughs> at that level, I would be in trouble. That's a lot of time. And I, <laughs> I try to protect my time quite a bit. So anyway, I encourage you to check it out. The course isn't for everyone. I drip out the course material. Some people want all the course material up front. I don't do that. I drip out the course material because I want you to go through the work. And I've tested it both ways. I know some people were thinking, hey, I'm smarter than the average asshole out there and I could do it faster. I could learn faster, blah, blah, blah. And maybe maybe you can, but most people can't. It turns out some stuff takes time, no matter what. You can't just like pick up a guitar and like know how to play stuff just because um, you learn faster. There are some musical people. That's a bad example. There's some musical people out there that are just going to be better, but there are some like physical things where like it will hurt your fingers if you have uh, you know t- tender fingertips out there and. They're soft. They're not callous yet. So when you try and mash on the strings and and do bar chords and stuff like that, the muscles are not yet strong enough. You literally have to put in the time, the physical time. And with a a course like this, you kind of have to use the tools. You have to use tools. You have to look at some of the specifics. You have to spend time uh, reading sites, uh, analyzing them, analyzing the competition. And that is one of the reasons why. I drip out the course. Uh, super rare occasions, all I will unlock it if someone happens to be pretty advanced and they, you know, they they're making ten thousand dollars a month already, and they want to see if they missed anything and then optimize and then work with me directly. Usually, those are premium students, by the way, that I unlock the course for. So anyway, I just want to emphasize that part. Uh, the main thing in the course is to do the work. And I know the framework works. There have been so many students that have gone through it and been successful. I am super confident that the framework, it works. One other interesting note, this is just a big commercial (laughs) for the course. Um, But one interesting note is that sometimes people know too much So I've definitely had the students who have studied for years. Maybe they haven't started their site yet, but they've been reading this stuff and watching YouTube videos, listening to podcasts for two, three, four years. They know more buzzwords and different techniques than maybe I do, but they haven't yet implemented it. And it turns out they actually know too much. So any one decision that they're trying to make, they could think of three or four or five reasons why it may not be the best decision. They're trying to maximize each decision and it's preventing them from getting started. And part of the value of the course is the lean framework. I strip away all the extra stuff. There are hundreds, probably thousands of little activities that you can do and probably the majority of them, maybe even 90% of them will provide value. They'll give you a little incremental gain. But if if you are just starting, it's not very, uh, it's not a good technique to do things that are optimizing by half a percent 
or a quarter of a percent or one percent, you should probably aim for like the broad strokes to get your site launched, get things rolling, start taking action, maybe get a little, little traffic to your site, maybe earn a, a few bucks here and there so that you're proving the concept. And basically I've distilled down a lot of the a lot of the noise so that you have a refined piece of uh, work to do, right? You have specific tasks to do in a specific order. And the big thing is like, you, you may have all this knowledge and you're doing it in the wrong order. You may have messed up on step two and then you're skipping around and doing all these other things when really you should be doing like simpler, straightforward things. By the way, a lot of uh, the work that a niche site entrepreneur, uh, a lot of the work that we're doing, it can be boring, right? It's exciting at first. You kind of have to figure out which part you're obsessed with. Maybe you're obsessed with the process. Maybe you're obsessed with the analytics and all the data. Maybe you like to analyze the competition and you really enjoy that. Maybe you love the topic like Christy, right? She It's a lifestyle for her. So she can really get into it. But you have to figure out some piece that you really enjoy. Anyway, a lot of a lot of the nuts and bolts, sitting at a laptop with your ass in the seat, maybe you have a standing desk, but you got your hands on a keyboard, mouse in your hand, and it's a little boring after a while. That is uh, what work is. <laughs> um, so you do have to figure out like which piece you like. Hopefully I'm not like talking people out of it at this point. But it's about doing work and it is very exciting. It is fun to hop into your analytics, see growth over time. There are some graphs and stuff that I'll be able to share from Christy. I think the best way to see that is probably going to be um, on this sales page for Five Figure Niche Site. Or you could check out the video, which I should be releasing roughly around the same time. (laughs) So it should be coming out this week. And you can see us, uh, you know, just the live interview, same audio and everything. But I'll be able to display the reports and her earnings and her expenses and all that stuff. Um, Okay, and I'll, you can check out the course. There's a link in the description. If you're listening to this after the enrollment period is closed, you can still sign up for the wait list. I launch it three other times um, per year, so four times per year, and you can check it out. I appreciate it if you do. And um, I think another, okay, I'll say one more thing and then I'll move on. Another cool thing when you enroll in a premium course like this and there's a Facebook group for the community aspect, you don't get customer support in there, you get a community. But basically, if you want to find a really good group of people to put together a mastermind group, join a course that's expensive and then you know everyone there has skin in the game You're all operating from like a baseline set of knowledge from within the course and everyone's serious about it because they spent money to be there as well. The problem with just random jokers that you may run into in another Facebook group that is maybe free is they don't know what the fuck they're talking about and maybe they're not serious about it and then you're wasting time with your interactions with them. It's not always the case. One of my first mastermind groups was, you know, in a, in a free uh, community and we met for five or six weeks. People slowly dropped off. I'm not going to say everyone failed, but no, none of the six people that I was meeting with, like, earned more money. And they, I think they all started, um, not all, I think three to four of them had internet marketing blogs as well. And they fizzled out. They ended up not doing anything and they still have their, their, uh, day jobs, which is fine. You know, working online isn't for everyone, but if you're listening to this still after 49 minutes of me talking, you're probably into it. So, okay. Check out the, the course if you want to. And if it is too expensive, I highly encourage you to just consume and use and utilize the free material that I have on this podcast, on YouTube, on my blog. It's better than most paid courses. I've had 
many people say, hey, you know what? I, I couldn't afford it, but I followed along. And uh, l- like Amin, I think. Um, Amin has followed along for years. He's listened to a lot of different pieces of content. And he's been able to put together the pieces now. I think a lot of times if people follow what's in the course, they end up doing better in the long run. And it is indeed, a. Sh- I think it's a shortcut because you are able to remove the noise and just do the stuff that works. So, okay. Wow, got a little worked up there. Sorry, everyone. Sorry about that. Let's talk about some upcoming episodes and interviews. I mentioned in the last couple of weeks, I kind of checked out a little bit in the tail end of 2019 as far as interviews goes, just because I was busy, other people were busy. I just didn't want to do interviews, but I am ramping it up for 2020. I'm going to be talking to Ron Stefanski. I'm going to be getting an update from John Dykstra. Um, I've interviewed those guys a couple times before some of the most popular interviews because they are really crushing it in their respective uh, areas. Both of those guys sort of focus on display ads, which is a nice twist because I talk about affiliate marketing most of the time and they do things uh, very differently. Ron is uh, more of a link building kind of guy. John doesn't build as many links and he leans on just huge amounts of content and his team to churn out a lot of content. I'll also be getting updates from Adrian Diaz. Um, He's also been working on a YouTube channel. Quick shout out for uh, Adrian's stuff out there. I'm going to be talking to Marty McLeod also. So I was able to meet Marty in the meetup uh, in Atlanta, which was super cool. And I'll be getting an update from him before too long as well. I'm also going to be pulling in some other folks that are sort of in the like website buying and selling and brokering areas. So I know people are very interested in that. I know there's a lot of folks out there either with sites that they they want to sell or they're thinking about selling it, but they're worried about the process or maybe revealing information to some broker that you don't know what they're going to do with the information. Maybe you're afraid you're going to have to pay a ton of taxes. I've worried about that in the past and taxes are ser- like once you start making good money, taxes are bananas. I will, I will tell you that you have to save um, your money. You have to understand quarterly uh, that you have to pay these taxes. There are penalties and different issues you can run into if you're not paying um, your estimates quarterly. This is in the U S but I assume, you know, most countries are, are operating where they're they're collecting taxes in, in a pretty serious way. And you don't want to screw up and, and find yourself in a position where you got paid a shitload of money, you spent a lot of money, and then you owe a tax bill for $75,000 or something crazy like that. Taxes are very serious. I usually... Um, Like I'm working very closely with my bookkeeper and and the folks doing my payroll. So I have a very good understanding of how much I'm going to be owing. And it's interesting to me. I'm fairly conservative as far as uh, like fiscal planning and stuff like that. And they're like, hey, we're going to, we need to uh, pay, you know, 30,000 or some kind of crazy $50 million in this quarter. Um, can we schedule that payment for whatever, January 15th? And I'm like, sure. Yeah, go for it. You can schedule it anytime you want. The money's there in the account. And uh, it makes me feel good because I know that um, I'm running uh, at least a tight operation. My margins are good. I'm saving the money. And um, I'm not in a situation where I have to like, defer paying the quarterly taxes to a future quarter, which would be so scary because that means um, that you you are spending a little too much. And anyway, taxes can be serious and we're gonna uh, we're gonna talk about that sort of thing. So it's uh, it's very interesting as far as how much money is out there, how how big these sites are and, and the ones that are being sold. They are, they are selling fast, even for, you know, multi hundreds of thousands of dollars, 
you can sell them really quickly. And if, if you've been out there watching on, say, uh, FE International, Empire Flippers, um, other broker type services that are out there, you probably see these sites are as expensive as a home <laughs> that people get a mortgage that they pay off for 30 years, yet they're selling like hotcakes out there. So anyway, I'll be having, uh, I will be interviewing a few folks in that arena. I think it'll be a big education for me and hopefully for you as well. Hopefully we can dig into uh, some of the, the details. And I know for a fact that a lot of the big brokers that we know of, um, people that I just mentioned, they got started like flipping affiliate sites and kind of doing it on the side and they've slowly grown. The market has matured in the you know short time that I've been involved, just the five or six years that I've been doing this stuff. The market is so different than it used to be. It's really amazing, really amazing. And the, and the values of these sites are really attractive for like private equity firms and just individual investors who are trying to diversify or get in the game with these content websites. Let's call it a day for now and we'll catch you on the next episode. 